Ave Maria. When, when we commit sin, um, there are consequences. The first is that no sin ever comes alone. It always comes with the rest of its family. And sometimes it um, comes with friends as well. You know, so, so that um, it's a serious affair. And in addition to that, in addition to the fact that, they, that sin never comes alone, is that it can drag other people into our sins. And there are, in fact, nine different ways in which we can share in other people's sins or in which they can share in our sins. And uh, we, see, we see examples of that in, in the scriptures. The, the first way, the first manner, um, not necessarily in seriousness, <clears throat> is, is that of counsel, giving advice. Um, the, one of the examples of giving advice that is sinful comes in 1 Kings chapter 12. And the background is simple enough. <clears throat> Solomon had died. <clears throat> and he was, Solomon had died, and he was succeeded by his son Rehoboam whom scripture calls the most foolish king. Solomon, although for all his wisdom, had fallen into a serious sin because he married um, foreign wives who were pagans. And it wasn't long before they put pressure on him and he permitted um, worship of these pagan gods, which the Lord didn't take too kindly to. And so he was punished. And the punishment, in fact, fell on his son. So, Rehoboam, in chapter 12, he, Rehoboam went to Shechem so that the, Israel, the, the people would acknowledge him to be king. And the people were dissatisfied because Solomon had um, extensive armies. He had a lot of building projects. He had uh, eight, well, 700 wives and 300 concubines to look after, or it might have been the other way around. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he had, um, he had problems. The, the people had problems because they're the ones who had to pay the taxes. So they came to him and they said to him, your father put on us a heavy yoke. If you now lighten the harsh service and the heavy yoke, your father imposed on us, we will serve you. Come back to me in three days, he answered. And the people left. Then Rehoboam consulted the elders who had been in his father's service while he was alive and asked, what answer do you advise me to give this people? He replied, if today you will be the servant of this people and submit to them, giving them a favorable answer, they will be your servants forever. But he ignored the advice of the elders and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and who were in his service. He said to them, what answer do you advise me to give this people who have asked me to lighten the yoke my father imposed on them? The young men who had grown up with him replied, this is what you must say to the people who have asked you to lighten the yoke your father had put on them. My little finger is thicker than my father's body. Whereas my father's put a heavy yoke on you, I will make it heavier. My father beat you with whips, I will beat you with scorpions. Well, so on the third day, when all Israel came back to King Rehoboam, as he instructed them to do, ignoring the advice of the elders he had given him, the king gave the people a harsh answer. He said to them, as the young men had advised him, my father put on you a heavy yoke, but I'll make it heavier. My father beat you with whips, I'll beat you with scorpions. And the king did not listen to the people. For the Lord brought it about to fulfill the prophecy he had uttered to Jeroboam of Nebat. And so we have the king giving this harsh answer. So what do you think the result is? Well, the people got very upset 
and they were told so all Israel went off to their tents but Rehoboam oh, sorry when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them the people answered the king what share have we in David we have no heritage in the son of Jesse to your tents for Israel now look to your own house David and so the Israel went off to their tents and so um, Rehoboam divides the kingdom by his stupid answer and the we have the ten tribes who go off to the to the north and in the south is just Judah tribe of Judah and tribe of Benjamin so we have then at um, Rehoboam himself who sins because of his pride he's blind um, he, he, he doesn't have the acumen to, to govern wisely as his father had done. He rejected the advice of the wise men and he preferred to follow the advice of the flatterers to his pride. He took the, the counsel of the young men. As it says in Proverbs, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. And so he provoked the people to rebellion. So he now is responsible for the people's rebellion. What is the consequence of the rebellion? First of all, they separated themselves from the line of David and consequently from the Messiah because the Messiah was promised to David and his descendants. They also separated themselves from the worship of God because now the Jehoroboam, who became the first king in Israel, the northern kingdom, um, recognized that the people kept going to Jerusalem, they'd soon return to David. So he decided to set up a false worship. He, 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 he set up two places of worship at, at um, Bethel and at Dan. And there he got priests, um, his own priests. And so the people go off into schism and eventually they end up in idolatry. I was responsible for that, Rehoboam, by his foolish response. Um, and so when leaders um, do foolish things, they are responsible for the sins of the people, as Rehoboam here is. And he, he provoked a schism, a division. And in, even in our day, we have the same thing when leaders provoke um, schisms and say they're not afraid of schisms. They are, in fact, um, endangering the people the salvation of the people as well as their own salvation. But the young advisors, they also shared in Rehoboam's sin because the counsel they gave was based on flattery. They wanted to ensure that they remained friends of the king. And the, of course, that is a, that was disastrous for the people of Israel. It's, we find this occurring again and again in history. So at the time of the English schism, Henry VIII, um, he had support from flatterers. They were the ones who saw an, an opportunity to gain something from the king, to gain, to, gain, to gain money, to gain position, to gain title, and so on. And these result, it resulted in the English church um, breaking away and the establishment of the Church of England. And, um, and so we, we, we need to to be aware, even when leaders are doing something foolish, we need to be aware that we have to keep our eyes fixed on God's purpose. We have another example in uh, Second Maccabees, um, and this time we have Eleazar. This is Second Maccabees, chapter six. The background. The, the Greeks, the Syrians, the Greeks have taken over Israel and they are insisting that the Jewish worship be abolished and that the Jews are to worship as the Gentiles do. In particular, they are to eat pig's meat. 
And we're told that, and, and this is chapter 6, verse 18, Eliezer, one of the foremost scribes, a man of advanced age and noble appearance, was being forced to open his mouth to eat pork. But preferring the glorious death to a life of defilement, he spat at the meat, the meat and went forward with his own accord to the instrument of torture, as men ought to do who have the courage to reject the food which is unlawful to taste even for love of life. Those in charge of that unlawful ritual meal took the man aside privately because of their long acquaintance with him and urged him to bring meat of his own providing, such as he could legitimately eat, and to pretend to eat some of it. In this way, he could escape the death penalty and be treated kindly because of their old friendship with him. But he made up his mind in a noble manner, worthy of his years, the dignity of his advanced age, the, the merit of distinction of his grey hair, and of the admirable life he had lived from childhood. And so he declared above all that he would be loyal to the holy laws given by God. He told them to send him at once to the abode of the dead, explaining, at our age, it would be unbecoming to make a pretense. Many young men would think that 90-year-old Eliezer had gone over to the alien religion. Should I thus dissimulate for the sake of a brief moment of life, they would be led astray by me, while I would bring shame and dishonor to my old age. Even if, for the time being, I avoid the punishment of men, I shall never, whether alive or dead, escape the hands of the Almighty. Therefore, by mindfully signing up, by mindfully giving up my life now, I'll prove myself worthy of my old age, and I will leave to the young a noble example of how to die willingly and generously for the revered and holy laws. He spoke thus and went immediately to the instrument of torture. Those who shortly before had been kindly disposed now became hostile towards him because of what he had said seemed to them utter madness. And so here we have a 90-year-old Jew. He's been ordered to eat pork as a sign of his rejection of his religion. And he's refused. So his friends, as you, as you heard, who knew him for a long time, they felt sorry for him. They felt compassion. And so they said to him, look, We'll, you, 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 you can choose the meat, you know, just pretend it's pork. And he refuses. Why? Because one of his concern for the young men who, seeing him do this, would think it was okay. So there's love of neighbor here. He refused to give a bad example to others. And his fear of God. He knew that what he was doing what he was doing would be dishonest and he feared god and being strong in faith and he had having the gift of fortitude he refused to to dissimulate also he'd be given scandal he'd be responsible for by his example leading others astray and he would be encouraging the sin of deceit what is interesting un unlike the case of of um, Rehoboam's friends, his, uh, Eliezer's friends acted out of compassion. They did not want to see him suffer. You know? And their compassion was misplaced because they were thinking more of his body than of his soul. And that was where the great danger for Eliezer lay. You know, um, because when you have friends who are, who are sympathetic, it's, it's very difficult to resist. We, we saw how it ended because those who before supported him thought him insane. You know, what is this madness? They could put it very simply. What does it matter whether you eat pork or beef? You know, why, why fuss? But the point, Elisa's point was that it's the law of God that matters and we have to be loyal to God first and foremost. And so he went, went to, his, to his death. 
And again, we see something similar in, in the uh, Protestant um, Revolution, where St. John Fisher was the only bishop out of 42 bishops in England to tell the king no. And the other bishops thought he was a madman. They thought, you know, what difference does it make whether the king um, divorces his wife or not? Um, yet this one man is the one who's remembered. We don't remember the names of the other bishops. And also in our own time, similarly, we find on moral issues that there are very few bishops who stand up and will talk about the law of God. And so the <clears throat> and so again we see that the whilst counsel advice can be given out of self-interest, it can also be given out of compassion. And so it has to be measured by some standard, and the standard we measure it should always be the law of God. And <clears throat> and another example we, we have is that of King Herod and Herodias. Again, another well-known story. Herod um, was, was a man much given to, to lust. That's where the majority of his problems arose. He had taken his brother's wife and so was guilty not only of adultery, but also of incest. His, the, his brother's wife, Herodias, was a very willing accomplice because um, Herod was far more influential than Philip, her husband. And so um, she was very upset, furious, when John the Baptist said, it is wrong for you to have your brother's wife. And John is arrested for that. Herod had his birthday party, and um, the the daughter of Herodias, Salome, danced for the king. And at such a party, of course, there would be drinking, and there would be, um, no <laughs> doubt, a lot of loose speaking. And um, the king then makes, then swears an oath that he would give her half his kingdom. The girl um, asks her mother what should she ask for and the mother says the head of John the Baptist. So this is very likely this whole thing was contrived. It was a plan you know, that uh, to bring about the death of John because Herod was afraid to execute John. The people regarded him as a prophet but because he swore an oath, you know, he's such a religious man, he has to keep his oath <clears throat> and so he sinned there, one, by false, by swearing rashly. It was thoughtless, it was unnecessary. And secondly, no oath is valid if the what is um, sworn is evil. John was innocent, and therefore to execute him was homicide, was murder. He, we're told that he was, Herod, was... Um, was ashamed to break his promise in front of the of the people who had gathered for his party. But that only shows a fear of man, of human respect, not fear of God. And then on top of that, there was the cruelty because kings on their birthdays usually released prisoners. But Herod decides to kill this particular prisoner. And so the head of John the Baptist is brought. What do we notice? Nobody said anything to the king. None of the guests objected. And so by their silence, they agreed with what Herod did. And so silence being consent, they also are guilty of murder, of homicide, of killing an innocent man and a prophet. And so we see this one sin of, of Herod now becomes everybody's sin. And these people have said nothing. So it's not sufficient um, to, to keep quiet. We must actually make it very clear when evil is being done, proposed, we must make it very clear that we object to it. And of course, Herodias gave bad counsel to her daughter. And because of that, Herodias is also guilty of 
John's death. So it's not only the king who commanded it, but also Herodias who counseled it and the girl who asked for it. So in a single moment, <clears throat> so, in, so in a single moment, everybody in the, in the area is involved in this sin. And where does it spring up from? It begins with lust and it just morphs and brings in all other sins. And so we, we see then that, that we see now that sin is something to be avoided because it never comes alone. It always has a family with it, it brings friends with it. And more serious, it can bring other people along and involve them in it. So we as we go through this um, season of Lent, let us ask the Lord for the insight into sin and its nature so that we might eradicate it from our lives and be freed of it through the blood of our Saviour. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.